Hey friends, what is up? How are you doing today? Welcome to another episode of Light from Mars. If you haven't noticed already, it is spooky season. You may not be watching this when it's still spooky season, but currently it is. It is October, okay? Peak spooky season. So I actually started this series like two months ago when it was not even spooky season yet, so I guess that's not really that relevant but but just keep in mind that this is actually part three in a whole series that I'm doing about this particular reddit thread that I am reading different stories from so there's actually a lot of context that you probably want to know from those videos so if you are stumbling upon this one first just keep in mind that you can maybe watch those other ones first just so you're really caught up on the story so yeah just saying I don't want anyone to get confused okay so before I start reading all of these terrifying stories and they are terrifying by the way just a warning like if you are someone that gets scared easily Easily, you're probably going to be very afraid right now <laughs> and also I wouldn't really recommend this for any children or anything like that I'm definitely not trying to be responsible for any trauma for anyone <laughs> so just a friendly warning all right this is about to get spooks spooks okay so before I get into the story I just want to say that if you are not already please do subscribe to my channel if you are a returning subscriber welcome back I love you get the best and if this is your first time on my channel, well, welcome. I make videos about all sorts of things, not just spooky content, all right? And I make all sorts of different content. I like to think that there's something there for everyone. That's what I like to say. So hopefully you can find something that you'd like as well. So please do consider hitting that subscribe button. And of course, give this video a big like if you do enjoy it. Now that that's out of the way, let us move on with these horrifying stories. <laughs> So just to give you some brief background, like I said, this is part three in a series that I'm doing of these stories. So you can go and watch those other videos for a lot more detail. But let me just give you a quick synopsis about what is going on in this series. So these stories originally, like I said, come from a post that was made on Reddit. So this post actually ended up having seven parts in the end. The original poster kept posting over and over with more stories because so many people were so interested in it. And it also drew a lot of similarities to other accounts that other people have also reported. So the title of this series is I am a search and rescue officer for the US Forest Service and I have some stories to tell. Let me tell you, this guy definitely has some stories to tell, all right? They are downright terrifying. Basically, throughout the series, he's just discussing different, very strange and unexplainable things, in some cases terrifying things, that have happened to him while he's been out in the wilderness. So some of these are related to actually missing people. Like I said, he's a search and rescue officer, so his job is literally to go find missing people that have gone missing in the woods. But not all of them are related to disappearances. Some of them are just really, really strange things that have happened to him or the people that he has worked with, people he knows, and they've shared their stories with him as well. So like I said, we have already talked about some very, very disturbing stories. So that being said, I'm going to get my trusty dusty iPhone. Trusty dusty, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> so I have to open the Reddit thread real quick because you would think that I would have already opened it because I'm already filming the video, the camera's on, but you would be wrong. <laughs> Also, just real quick before I start, I do want to say that if you go and read these threads, you are going to notice that I do not include every single story. And the reason for that is that I do not physically think that I could even speak those words on YouTube without getting banned. <laughs> okay, like, I'm talking some very gruesome stuff and things that are pretty disturbing. So, reader discretion advised. And I'm literally not telling you the worst of the worst. So, if you're curious, go back and check those out if you guys want the uncensored version of these stories. <laughs> Alrighty, let's get into part three of this madness. So, I'm just going to skip to the third story because this is how it starts. It says, I honestly don't know how I've forgotten this story but it is by far the scariest thing that's happened to me. Okay, so this is about to get real real. I'm excited, this is gonna be a good one. I guess maybe I've tried so long to forget about it that it just didn't come to mind right away. As someone who spends literally all of their time in the woods, you don't ever want to let yourself get scared of being alone or in the middle of nowhere. I can definitely see that. That would make it like impossible to work. That's why when you have experiences like this, you tend to just forget about them and move on. This, to date, the only thing that's ever made me really consider if this job is the right one for me. I don't really like talking about it much, but I'll do the best I can to remember it all. 
As I recall, this took place right after the end of spring. It was a typical lost child call. Y'all know it's gonna get real if it's a lost child, so just warning. A four-year-old girl had wandered away from her family's campsite and had been missing for about two hours. Her parents were completely despondent and told us what most parents do. My kid would never wander away. She's so good about staying close. She's never done anything like this before. We assured the parents that we'll do everything we can to find her and we spread out in a standard search formation. I was partnered with one of my good buddies, and we were sort of casually holding conversation while we hiked. I know it sounds callous, but you do sort of become desensitized when you've done this long enough. It becomes the norm, and I think to a certain extent, you have to learn to desensitize yourself in order to work this job. We searched for a good two hours, going well beyond where we think she'd be and we come out of a small valley where something makes us both stop in unison. We freeze and look at each other, and there's almost a sensation like a plane depressuring. My ears pop, and I have this odd sensation of having dropped about 10 feet. I start to ask my buddy if he felt that, but before I can, we hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. It's almost like a freight train passing directly above us but it's coming from every direction at once, including above and below us. He screamed something to me, but I can't hear him over this deafening roar. Understandably freaked out, we look all around us trying to find the source of the sound, but neither of us sees anything. Can you imagine that, guys, in the middle of the woods? Just hearing something like that? What, what could that possibly be if it's not a plane or a train? Of course, my first thought is a landslide. Okay, okay, I could, I could definitely see that. Maybe some sort of geological event or whatever. But we were not near any cliffs. And if we were, it would have hit us by now. The sound goes on and on. Oh my god, I thought it already ended by this point. But even standing close together, we can't hear anything but this sound. Then, as suddenly as it starts, it stops. Like someone threw a switch and cut it off. We stand there for a second perfectly still and slowly the normal sounds of the woods come back. He asked me what the f just happened, but I just kind of shrug and we stand there looking at each other for a minute. I get on the radio and ask if anyone else just heard the end of the f***ing world, but no one heard it, even though we're all within shouting distance of each other. I wouldn't think I was going crazy or I don't know, I would just want to get out of there. That is terrifying. Are you kidding? My buddy and I just sort of shrug it off and keep going. Yeah, no big deal. That's just, you know, it's casual, whatever. About an hour later, we all check up on the radios and no one's found the little girl. Most of the time, we won't search when it gets dark. But because we don't have any kind of lead on her, a few of us decide to keep going, including me and my buddy. Damn, guys, that is that is crazy because I could see where this guy would definitely want to help this little girl. But also, I do not know how he just so casually shrugged that insane experience off. That would be so scary. But then again, I do understand, like he said, you don't really want to make yourself afraid because then it's like, how can you even do the job? I mean, that's tough. That's honestly pretty rough. <laughs> We keep close together and we're calling out for her every couple of minutes. At this point, I'm hoping beyond hope that we find her. Because while I may not like kids, the idea of them being all alone in the dark is awful. The woods can be intimidating to kids in the daylight. At night, well, it's a whole different beast. Yeah, I bet. But we're not seeing any signs of her or getting any responses and around midnight we decide to turn around and head back to the rendezvous point. We're about halfway back when my buddy stops and shines his light to the right of us into a really thick deadfall or group of dead trees. I ask him if he's heard a response but he just tells me to be quiet for a second and listen. I do and in the distance I can hear what sounds like a kid crying. We both call the girl's name and listen for any kind of response, but it's just this really faint crying. We head in the direction of this deadfall and go around it, calling her name over and over. As we get closer to the crying, I start to get this really weird feeling in my gut, and I tell my buddy that something isn't right. <laughs> he tells me he feels the same way, but we can't figure out what it is. We stop where we are and call the girl's name again. And at the same time, we both figure it out. The crying is on a loop. 
It's the same little hitching sob, then wail, then quiet hiccup, repeated over and over. It's exactly the same every time. And without saying another word, we just both take off running. Oh my God, can you imagine? How is that possible? A loop of a little child crying? Guys, that is just like, that is some dark shit. Even if it were possible for a human to somehow pull that off like a prank, I guess it's technically possible, but even so, who would do that? Like either way, you probably got some really messed up energies going on. So paranormal or not, that sounds like a very sketchy, sketchy situation, especially knowing that they were looking for a little kid. Like it feels like they were specifically trying to mess with them or whatever this was, right? Was specifically trying to mess with these people. How did they even know that they were going to be there? That's just, oh. It's the only time I've ever lost my composure like that, but something about it was so incredibly wrong and neither of us wanted to stay out there anymore. When we got back to the rendezvous, we asked if anyone else had heard anything strange, but no one else knew what we were talking about. I know it sounds sort of anticlimactic, but that call fucked me up for a long time. As for the little girl, we never found a trace of her. We keep an eye out for her and all the other people who we've never found, but frankly, I doubt we'll ever find anything. <sighs> All right, guys, that is the first story. That is just, that is crazy. Like I said, I just, I don't know what could even cause that. And I'm just honestly past the point of even trying to speculate because who freaking knows? What do you guys think? What could have possibly caused that? I could understand. That sounds like the most traumatic work day <laughs> ever. <laughs> of the missing person calls I've gone on, only a handful have ever resulted in a complete disappearance, meaning no trace of the person and body ever found. But sometimes finding a body just leads to more questions than answers. Here are some of the bodies that we found that became infamous in our team. The first one, a teenage boy whose remains were recovered almost a year after he vanished. We found the top of his skull, two finger bones, and his camera almost 40 miles from where he was last seen. The camera, sadly, was destroyed. The second one, the pelvis of an older man who had vanished a month earlier. That's all we found. Next, the body of a 10-year-old girl, almost 20 miles from where she vanished. She had died of exposure three weeks after going missing and all of her clothes were intact except for her shoes and jacket. There were berries and cooked meat in her stomach when they did the autopsy. The coroner said it appeared as if someone had been taking care of her. There were no suspects ever identified. Now, if you guys have seen the other parts, that probably sounds very familiar. There are already other stories that I have mentioned with this almost exact same scenario. Children, obviously, more than likely would have a lot more difficulty surviving and being self-sustaining, especially in the middle of the wilderness compared to an adult. It might be a little more believable, right, that an adult could pick their own berries and cook their own meat, but a young child, that seems highly unlikely, especially considering these children are found so far from their original place where they vanished. So very unexplainable. Like who is taking care of this little girl? The berries, right? We've already seen that also in other stories. Disappearances involving berries, right? Children being fed berries by these mysterious creatures, I guess you could say. So again, very, very, very strange. I could see that that would be extremely haunting. Now on to a couple of the stories my friends told me. I mentioned that you were all interested in the stairs and you're in luck. He's had a closer encounter with them. Though he doesn't have any explanation for them, he does have a little bit more experience with them than I do. So now we're finally getting into the stairs, guys. Are you ready? Ah, I'm not ready. I'm totally not ready. Okay, let's go. My buddy had been a search and rescue officer for about seven years. He started when he was a junior in college and he had a very similar experience when he first encountered the stairs. His trainer told him almost the same thing mine did, which was to never go near, touch, or ascend them. For the first year, he did just that, but apparently his curiosity got the better of him. And on one call, he broke away from the line and went to go check a set of them out. He said that they were about 10 miles from the path where a teenage girl had vanished and the dogs were following a scent. He was on his own, lagging behind the main group when he saw a set of stairs off to the left. They looked like they were from a new house, 
because the carpeting was pristine and white. He said that as he got closer, he didn't feel any different or hear any weird noises. He was expecting something to happen, like bleeding from his ears or collapsing, but he just got right up to them and didn't feel anything. The only thing he said that was odd was that there was absolutely no debris on the steps. No dirt, leaves, dust, anything. And there didn't appear to be any signs of an animal or insect activity in the immediate area, which he found strange. It was less like things were avoiding them and more like they just happened to be in a relatively barren part of the forest. He touched the stairs and didn't feel anything except that sort of sticky feeling you get from new carpet. Making sure his radio was on, he slowly climbed the stairs. He said it was terrifying because the way they'd been stigmatized, he wasn't really sure what was going to happen to him. He joked that half of him expected to be teleported to some other dimension, and the other half was waiting for a UFO to come swooping down. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Honestly, that's like, that's definitely what I would think too. But he got to the top with little event and he stood there looking around. But, he said, the longer he stood on the top step, the more he felt like he was doing something very, very wrong. He said it was the feeling you'd get as if you were in the part of a government building that you had no business being in. As if someone was going to come and arrest you or shoot you in the back of the head at any second. He tried to brush it off, but the feeling got stronger and stronger. And that's when he realized he couldn't hear anything anymore. Again, this is super common. I've seen so many stories, not even just from this thread of people reporting this. If you are ever in the middle of the wilderness, even if it's not the forest, and you suddenly stop hearing the noises of all the animals and the insects and just the normal sounds of the forest or of the nature wherever you are, that is not a good sign, okay? That very well is probably a sign that you are among some energy or some entities or whatever that you do not want to be messing with. So just a fair warning sign, if you ever experience something like that where you can no longer hear the other sounds going on, make sure you get away from that area ASAP. The sounds of the forest were gone and he couldn't even hear his own breathing. It was like some kind of weird, awful tinnitus, but more oppressive. He climbed back down and rejoined the search and didn't mention what he'd done. But he said the weirdest part came after. His trainer was waiting back at the welcome center after the search ended for the day, and he cornered my buddy before he could leave. He said his trainer had this intense look of anger, and he asked what was wrong. You went up then, didn't you? My buddy said it wasn't phrased like a question. He asked how his trainer knew. The trainer just shook his head. Because we didn't find her. The dogs lost her scent. My buddy asked what that had to do with anything. The trainer asked how long he'd been on the stairs, and my buddy said no more than a minute. The trainer gave him this really awful, almost dead-eyed look, and told him that if he ever went up another set of stairs, he'd be fired immediately. The trainer walked away, and I guess he's never answered any of the questions my buddy asked him about it since. All right, so that seems to be a trend with these stairs. No matter what, it seems like if somebody goes up to them or touches them or gets near them or whatever gives in to their lure in any way, either that person gets hurt or something bad happens to that person or another person nearby gets hurt or something bad happens to them. It's almost like this domino effect that something bad will happen if somebody goes near the stairs and it might not happen to you but it might happen to somebody else. So again, how weird, can you imagine? His boss literally knew, he knew that he went up the stairs. How would he even know that? I don't think that he would just automatically assume that just because they didn't find her that's what happened but I mean it kind of seems like that's exactly what he thought so I'm sure that this guy probably knows more than what he's letting on and I can also probably assume by the description of how upset and dead-eyed quote that this guy was that he probably doesn't really like talking about it and probably never will. All right so there is two stories left on this thread and I'm not gonna lie they're both pretty disturbing, but I am going to read them to you guys. For the second one, I'm probably going to have to emit some of the more graphic detail, but um, like I said, if you want to read the full stories, I would highly recommend you click the link and read
named it on Reddit. So let's get into these next two stories. My buddy has been involved in a lot of missing persons cases where there's never been a trace of them found. I mentioned David Polites and my buddy said he can confirm that those stories are, for the most part, accurate. So real quick, I did mention this again in another video so I won't go too much into it, but David Polites is actually an author who wrote a series of books called The Missing 411 that basically describes extremely strange and unexplainable disappearances that have happened in the national parks. So pretty much along the exact same lines of what this guy is talking about, which is why so many people commented saying, oh my god, do you realize all the parallels between your experiences and the stories that David Polites talks about? Also, just for the record, although there's really no way to prove 100% that this guy on this Reddit forum is being completely truthful or that these things really happened, the David Polites books are in fact based completely on reality. This guy was actually previously a police detective, so he discusses these cases that are very much real. And he doesn't even really try to speculate on what's causing them, even though it's obviously very questionable and completely mysterious, hence why he's written like seven books on it now. But if you are interested in this, you can definitely also check out his books or just look him up on YouTube and there's a lot more stories to hear, so just know that. My buddy said for the most part, he can confirm that those stories are accurate. He said that most of the time, if the person isn't found right away, they're either never found or they're found weeks, months, or years later in places they can't possibly have gotten to. One story he told me really stood out that involved a young boy with a severe mental disability. He was also physically handicapped, and his parents explained over and over that he simply could not have vanished. It was impossible. Someone had to have taken him. My buddy said that they searched for the kid for weeks, going miles out of the accepted range, but it was like he'd never been there. The dogs couldn't pick up a scent anywhere, not even in the picnic area where he reportedly vanished from. Suspicion fell on the parents, but it was pretty clear that they were devastated and hadn't done anything sinister to their kid. The search was concluded about a month later, and my buddy said everyone had pretty much forgotten about it by later in the winter. He was out on a training op in the snow, on one of the higher peaks, when he came across something in the snow. He said he saw it from far away at first, and when he got closer, he realized it was a shirt, frozen and sticking part way out of the powder. He recognized it as belonging to the kid because it had a distinctive pattern. About 20 yards away, he found the kid's body, laying partially buried in the snow. My buddy said, there was no way the kid had been dead for any more than a few days, even though he'd been missing for almost three months. Again, just like that other story and just like others I told, these kids somehow surviving in the wilderness for months in the winter? How is that possible without some other assistance? Again, someone taking care of them. Whew, okay guys, I just read a few sentences ahead and this is where it's about to get rough, all right? As if it's not already rough enough. The kid was curled around something, and when my buddy brushed off the snow to see what it was, he said he almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was a big chunk of ice that had been carved crudely to look like some sort of person. The kid was holding on to it so tight that it had frostbitten in his chest and hands, which my buddy could tell even with the decay that had taken place. He radioed the rest of the crew and they took the body off the mountain. Now he recapped all this for me. And to put it simply, there is no way that this kid could have survived for almost three months on his own or have gotten to this peak. There was no physical way that this child could have walked almost 50 miles and ended up on the top of a goddamn mountain. To top it off, there was nothing in the kid's stomach or digestive tract. Nothing, not even water. It was like, my buddy said, the kid had been taken off the face of the earth, put in suspended animation, and dropped on this mountain months later, only to die of exposure. He never really got over that one. Oh God, that story is like, it's really enough to give you nightmares. I mean, seriously, just that one alone. The thought of that little child holding that ice thing that was shaped like a person? Where did that come from? I want to know that too. I don't, I don't think that that kid would do that. That just does not seem right to me. Just 
I mean, obviously that whole thing doesn't seem right to me. I mean, I don't even know what to say about that one, guys. It's obviously horrifying. So draw your own conclusions, I guess, on what could have possibly caused that. But like he said, I mean, it was like the kid had vanished from the earth. Like, how could he not even have food in his system and survive three months? Again, it just, it doesn't even make sense. So there is one story left in this part of the thread, guys. Okay, so... Buckle up, because we got one more to go through. I know it's been a rough ride, but we're almost at the finish line. The last story I'll share from him was one that took place relatively recently, only a few months ago. They were out doing a recon for mountain lions because there had been several reports of sightings in the last couple of days. One of our jobs is to scout out the areas where these animals are seen to ensure that if they are in the area, we can warn people and close off those trails. He was out on his own in a very heavily forested part of the park around dusk when he heard what sounded like a woman screaming in the distance. Now, as most of you know, maybe you don't, maybe you don't know this, but when a mountain lion screams, it sounds almost exactly like a woman being brutally murdered. It's unsettling, but far from abnormal. That is actually true. Now, I would not say that it sounds exactly like a woman screaming, although people say that. To me, I mean, I can still tell that it's a mountain lion, but it does sound eerily similar, so that is definitely true. <laughs> My buddy radioed back and let Ops know that he heard one and that he was going to see if he could figure out where its territory started. He heard the mountain lion scream a couple more times, always from the exact same spot, and determined the approximate area of the mountain lion's territory. He was about to head back when he heard yet another scream, this time within only a few yards of him. Oh god, girl! You better run, you better get out of there. <laughs> of course he freaks out and starts heading back at a much faster pace because the last thing he wants is to run into a goddamn mountain lion and get mauled to death, right? That makes sense. <laughs> As he got back on the path and started heading back, the screaming followed him and he broke into a jog. When he was about a mile from Ops, the screaming stopped and he turned around to see if it was following him. It was almost night by this point, but he said in the distance, just before the path rounded a corner, he could see what looked like a male figure. He called out to them, warning them that the paths were closed and that he needed to come back to the welcome center. The figure just stood there and my buddy started to walk over. When he was about 10 yards away, the figure took, as he described, an impossibly long step towards him. Oh God, like just thinking about that. <sighs> All right. <laughs> and let out the same scream my buddy had been hearing. Of course, of course, right, right. <laughs> my buddy didn't even say anything. He just turned and sprinted back to Ops. That's the exact same thing I would do. <laughs> Never looking behind him. By the time he got back, the screaming had moved back into the woods. He didn't mention it to anyone else just said that there was a mountain lion in the area and that they needed to close those paths until the animal could be located and moved. You know, that guy probably rationalized that situation to himself. I feel like maybe even part of him didn't believe it, especially when they're experiencing all of these crazy things. Like the main guy said, I'm sure that a lot of the times they kind of just block it out and it almost becomes normal. So I'm actually not even surprised that that guy lied about that and that he would just say it's mountain lion because I mean, it still will keep people away. So whether it's mountain lion or whether it's some creepy man, your entity thing pretending to be a mountain lion, either way, it's probably best to keep people away from there. So I think he did a good job overall. So that is the end of part three, guys. Oh my God, I know these were some rough stories. I always have to film these videos during the day and when I'm not alone in the house because if I do it at night or when I'm alone, it's like after I film the video, I'm like, Oh, paranoid. So I understand it's a lot to handle, but I do hope you guys are enjoying or at least are overall entertained by this series. I know this original thread was extremely popular and got so, so many replies. So please make sure that you give this video a big like if you did enjoy it so that I can know that I should definitely make a part four because yeah, we're actually not even halfway through with the stories yet. So believe it or not, you have not heard all that is yet to come. So I highly recommend you guys like this video if you did enjoy it so that you can hear the part four stories.
And again, if you are not already, please, please do subscribe to my channel. Please make sure that you go check out my other videos and hit that subscribe button if you like what you see. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyways, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you on the next one. Bye.